welcome you to our fourth and final business forum of the 2018-19 season. Today's business forum presented in conjunction with the Office of Congresswoman Grace Meng, the Office of State Assemblywoman Nylee Brodzik, and the Greater Flushing Chamber of Commerce as part of its Summer Business Expo. There's more information on the table in the back about the expo. We are all thankful for their support. Our forum is being recorded and will air on Queens Public Television. We are once again pleased to have such a great turnout this morning for our panel discussion about the issues facing Asian American women entrepreneurs. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsors for this season. Fow Fritz, PricewaterhouseCoopers, New York Presbyterian Queens, SCORE, New York Metro Areas, and today's special corporate sponsor, Investors Bank. In addition, I would like to thank our community sponsors, Borough President Melinda Katz, the Queen's Chamber of Commerce, the Queen's Economic Development, Development Corporation, Queen's Public Television, the Daily News, and the Greater Flushing Chamber of Commerce. Our forums are presented solely from the generous donations of our sponsors. If anyone here is interested in supporting our forums, we are suggesting a nominal donation of $25. Donations can be given to anyone at the reception table, or you can see me at the end of the forum. Now, please join me in welcoming our provost, Elizabeth Hendry. Good morning, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to campus on such a beautiful day. Um, and if you have a chance, I'd invite you to uh, take a stroll around the campus afterwards because I have to say it's looking beautiful right now. And although it's, it's going to be warm, but it is just an absolutely gorgeous day. So I hope you have that uh, opportunity. So it's been an exciting year of change here at Queens College. Uh, among other things, uh, it's a little bittersweet, but our former president, Felix Matos Rodriguez, who many of you have seen at these business forums over the past five years, has left us to become the chancellor of CUNY. So we couldn't be happier about that in one way, in another way, we're, we're sad. But we uh, also welcomed on June 1st, uh, interim president, uh, Bill Tramontano, who I'm sure you'll be meet, could not be here today, but I'm sure you will be meeting at uh, future business forums. He brings a wealth of experience at CUNY. He was uh, he's a biologist. He served as a uh, dean at Lehman, provost at Brooklyn College, and most recently as um, vice president at Hunter College. So we are so pleased to have him uh, leading the campus during this transition. I'd also like to mention. And we've talked about this a little in previous business forums, but now it's happening, that uh, on May 6th, Queens College, in partnership with LaGuardia Community College, opened its new Small Business Development Center outreach office in Casino Hall. And I'd like to thank Dean Michael Wolf. I'd also like to thank Congresswoman Grace Meng and from her office, Fascia Classes, here today for all their hard work in making that possible. And I'd like to ask its director, Rosa Figueroa, who's one of our panelists, and the two new business advisors, Amber Chen and Michael Maldonado, to stand up so we can recognize them. <laughs> and the, the Queens College SBDC is now ready to assist small businesses in the community and I invite you to talk to them more following today's forum to learn about it and how it can assist. Now, it's my pleasure, and this is always a great part of the forums, to present today's business forum scholarships made possible by Investors Bank. Investors Bank has traditionally sponsored our June business forum. Besides that sponsorship, they have generously provided scholarships for $2,500 to two Queens College business students. 
Investors Bank is a full-service community bank that has been serving customers since 1926, and their charitable foundation supports local and statewide organizations that enrich the quality of life in their communities. I'd like to call up William Brown, Senior Vice President and Head of Retail Banking, to assist with the presentation. Is he? And I'm going to introduce and call up the two winners and ask them both to remain on stage so we can sure. get a photo. So the first winner is Iris Fang. She's doing a Bachelor of Arts in Accounting and Information Systems with a minor in Economics. She's expected to graduate in December 2019. She's got a 4.0 GPA. She's on the Dean's List, actually, with that GPA, I'm sure she's on the president's list. <laughs> uh, she currently works 24 hours per week while ascending QC full time. She's an active member of ASCEMD and a member of the Golden Key International Honor Society. She also holds a BA in East Asian Studies and Chinese from Queens College. And I don't know, is Iris here today? Okay, please come up. Congratulations. <laughs> And our second winner is Hazel Hernandez, also doing her Bachelor of Arts in Accounting and Information System, expected to graduate in May 2020. Her GPA is 3.88. She's on the dean's list, and, and with that one, the provost list too, uh, Dr. Robert Bloom Scholarship, Presidential Scholarship, and the Esther Book Club. She's the treasurer for Ascend and was a, vo thank you, sorry, was a volunteer with the Volunteer Income Tax Assistant Program, where our students give volunteer assistance uh, to uh, individuals who need help with their income taxes from January to April 15th of this year. So uh, let me ask, <laughs> let me congratulate both of our winners and thank you to Investors Bank for your generous uh, sponsorship and support of these. So thank you. You're very welcome. And maybe we. Now, um, before we get started with today's panel, uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce Assemblywoman Nellie Razek. She represents the 25th District, which includes parts of Northeast Queens and, of course, Queens College. And she's a longtime friend of the college. Recently, she joined us on campus to announce funding for upgrades to our athletic track. In Albany, she's been an outspoken advocate for our students and faculty and continues to champion legislation to expand access to affordable higher education. She was elected in 2012 and became the youngest woman in the state legislature and the first woman ever to represent the 25th district. She's on the assembly Ways and Means, Labor, Energy, Correction, <laughs> Corporations, Authority and Commissions, and Consumer Affairs and Protection Committees, and is a member of the Black Puerto Rican, Hispanic, and Asian Legislative Caucus and the Puerto Rican Hispanic Task Force. She also chairs the State Assembly's Office of State Federal Relations and has led efforts to protect DACA and TPS holders, strengthen environmental protection regulations, and safeguard access to quality and affordable health care. And I also want to thank her for her role in making today's event possible. So it's my pleasure to ask you all to join me in welcoming Assemblywoman Razek. Good morning, everyone. Um, so it's my great honor and privilege to be here with all of you. Um, Thank you so much, Provost, for the warm introduction and Queens College for hosting us. Um, it is bittersweet. I actually think that this is the first event I've done without Phalo around. So if he's watching, shout out to him. Um, I would also really love to thank John Cho and his team at Greater Flushing Chamber of Commerce for partnering with us today to facilitate the discussion that you're about to hear. Um, and in general, for being there for API women in business throughout the year. I also want to thank our Congresswoman, Grace Meng, who sends her warm wishes and warm regards. I spoke to her yesterday, and she wishes she could be here. Um, and this month, this event was actually months in the making, if not a year, um, in part because of John Cho's great efforts. But I also want to single out Amanda, 
who is an intern in my office who came up with this idea about a year or so ago when she was our summer intern. So let's give Amanda a warm round of applause. She's a Fresh Meadows kid, doesn't go to Queens College, don't hold that against her. Um, our discussion today serves as a kickoff to elevate women's leadership and close the gap in sectors that have traditionally been dominated by men. It's with great pleasure that I'm, I'm happy that we can bring together today's panelists and shed some light on their experiences, hopefully to pass it on to people like Iris um, and future generations. It's through these exchanges that we as policymakers and community leaders can learn from one another and figure, really figure out what laws, regulations, and resources are in place and are working or aren't working for women-owned businesses. This year in, the, uh, in, in Albany, we actually did something right. We expanded MWBE um, laws and regulations, increased the thresholds, and streamlined certification processes so that women will have more access to government contracts to city and state agencies. Um, and I'm hopeful maybe next year we can do this panel again and see if that has helped or hasn't helped and we need to do more. Um, I'm hopeful that today's morning discussion will be a continued dialogue that we can build on. You should view both Grace and I as resources, as people who are advocates and want to help um, grow and start your businesses right here in Queens. So I'm ever thankful for Queens College for creating this space for all of us to share, enjoy, and exchange ideas. Thank you. And now I would like to invite John Cho, Director of the Greater Flushing Chamber of Commerce, to give a few remarks. Good morning. Thank you so much for having us here. Um, Queens College is a great host. I want to thank Dean Michael Wolf, um, Assistant uh, Vice President uh, Jeff Rosenstock, and our Provost uh, Elizabeth Hendry, uh, who recently joined our board as the Vice President of our board. Um, you know, the chamber here is really uh, trying to do our best to serve. Um, a huge need in this community, which is to support small local businesses. Um, it's an issue that's close to my heart. Um, I spoke uh, this morning with Christina, and she reminded me about my mother. You know, my mother would um, wake up early in the morning, um, feed the children, um, then go to work uh, with um, uh, operating her store. And then sometimes in the evening, she'll come and do garment work um, late into the evening. And that's the type of um, person who is an entrepreneur in our community who um, day in and day out um, keeps our community alive. Um, they are the ones who uh, made flushing possible. Um, those are the people that we need to support and, and assist. And I think that um, I would like to challenge actually some of the policymakers. Um, instead of giving billions of dollars to the wealthiest corporation and the wealthiest man in the United States, let's create a $5 billion fund for women owned businesses in the state of New York. Is everyone with me there? Um, uh, I think you're going to, uh, this is a rare treat to have some of our members here, Christina and Bianca, who are some of the, the best entrepreneurs in Flushing. Um, you know, they have really contributed uh, mightily to um, our community, and I hope you will take their words um, and their experience into consideration uh, when you uh, support local businesses, when you create programs for businesses in our community. Um, and lastly, uh, I know someone mentioned before that we have a program uh, at the Sheraton today at 12 o'clock. Um, please come. Um, our uh, staff, Angelina and Irene, put a lot of work into creating these presentations and workshops for our business community. Um, we're also launching our Passport to Flushing, which is um, our way of supporting local businesses 
um, is a great way to contribute to our economy, but also uh, get great discounts to local restaurants and venues. Thank you so much. And as John says, this is just uh, one part of a, a day of planned activities uh, that the, the Greater Flushing of Chamber of Commerce is uh, sponsoring. Um, so let me also thank um, both Diane Schultz and Dean Michael Wolf for their work in making the whole series of business forums possible throughout the year, and particularly for uh, their hard work um, working with the Greater Flushing Chamber uh, to make this wonderful panel a reality. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Jennifer Rambaran. She is a director in the Regulatory Risk and Quality Control Group of PricewaterhouseCoopers, where she works directly with the firm's issuer, audit, engagement partners, their teams, and PwC leadership. She has 17 years of experience in a wide array of roles, including relations with audit firm regulators, external audit, internal audit, and tax. She actively recruits Queens College students to the firm and works with the Queens College Center for Career Engagement to advise students on resume building, presentation skills, and the cultivation of a professional brand. She holds a BA in accounting from Queens College with a minor in the BALA program and is a member of the New York Society of CPAs. Please well, join me in welcoming Jennifer, who will now introduce today's panelists for what I'm sure will be a very insightful discussion on the subject of Asian American women entrepreneurs. So please welcome Jennifer Rambo. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for making time out of your day to join us for this great panel discussion this morning. Uh, first, I will introduce our panel um, and provide, and they'll provide a little uh, bit of background about themselves. Um, then we'll jump right into our um, discussion points. And lastly, we'll, ha we'll leave about 10 minutes at the end for any questions from the audience. So um, just wanted to note in the, um, first, uh, there's been a change in today's program. Uh, Hannah Tran, uh, Tammy Mooney, and Rebecca Edwards were unable to join us today on the panel. But we are very pleased and thankful that Dr. Ying Zhu, uh, Rosa Figueroa, and Bianca Ng have agreed to join us in today's discussion. So first I'll introduce everyone. Um, to my left is, um, is Rosa Figueroa. Um, then uh, secondly, uh, it's Bianca Ng, then Christina Seed, and then uh, Dr. Ying Zhu. Um, so their detailed um, bios are in the pamphlets that are on your desk, so I figured uh, we could jump right into our discussion rather than going through those, and they'll also be sharing their personal stories. Um, so we'll start off with the personal stories. Uh, Rosa, would you like to start us off? Um, yes, I was, um, my name is Rosa Figueroa. I've been working with the SBDC for over 25 years. And um, I was working with, when I started at LaGuardia Community College in 2002, it was right after 9-11. Mm -hmm. And we were, in 2002, we were able to work with the Asian community in, in Chinatown and also in Flushing. Since then, uh, I worked as a business advisor, then uh, worked as a, an associate director and have been working um, at LaGuardia for the last, I would say, seven, eight years as a uh, director. And I am very pleased to work and assist the Asian community, the Flushing community, which is my community. I, I graduated from, from Queens College, and I also have been living here for 40 years. And I, um, we have, we provide our services in, in, China, in Mandarin and Korean and in Spanish. Thank you. Bianca? Hi, good morning everyone. My name is Bianca. I'm the second generation owner of COTS Travel and also a partner in a bus company. And our, our, my family. Good. Okay. 
Mm -hmm. My family started um, the travel agency in Flushing uh, for almost 30 years and we offer all sorts of uh, travel products like uh, charter bus, airline ticketing, uh, cruises, hotel reservations and guided tours. Um, our, uh, our company um, our company has been uh, serving the Flushing uh, community um, and we are very grateful that the community also very supportive of us and uh, I'm also very involved in the community to give back. Uh, I'm currently serving on the board of uh, Greater Flushing Chamber of Commerce, uh, the Flushing Business Improvement District, um, also the Board of Trustees of Queen's Botanical Garden and I also served as a uh, past uh, vice president of Flushing Central Alliance Clubs and also was a member of the Women Presidents Organization. So, um, yes, it's a, it seems like a lot of, seems like a lot of titles and it's, it really um, takes a lot of uh, time, very, very hard time management to juggle all this. Um, so I guess we will get into that more. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And you will all get to know Christina better um, thanks to a video created by the Greater Flushing uh, Chamber and 60 First Productions as part of its innovative Made in Flushing business support program. So I will, if you just uh, view the two screens, we'll um, watch a short video. I scream, you scream, and with all this heat, we're all screaming for ice cream. For the last 30 years, Christina Seed's family has been creating dozens and dozens of heavenly ice cream flavors. Mmm, oh, that's delicious. I love your ice cream. It's really good, huh? The Chinatown Ice Cream Factory. The original Chinatown Ice Cream Factory. Chinatown Ice Cream Factory is a Chinatown must, probably because it makes its own ice creams and exotic flavors you just can't find anywhere else. Some favorites include taro, ginger, leaky. Ooh. Maybe I might do a cucumber ice cream. Hi, I'm Christina. I'm the co-owner of the Chinatown Ice Cream Factory and now Flushing Ice Cream Factory. Hello, Da Xia Chen. My father started Chinatown Ice Cream Factory in 1978. We decided to open in Flushing because I was born and raised in Queens. I went through Flushing almost every day through high school. It's a big part of my life. My kids eat ice cream for breakfast, and it's so bad. It's like, it, it, it's milk, and it's like... Flushing is its own like special neighborhood. It's like Sesame Street. <laughs> That's really what it is. It's like you walk down the block, and then you know everybody. So we wanted to create something that was special to the community. Even though we have all of our classic flavors from Chinatown, we also have a couple of exclusive flavors to Flushing. We have the misagaru and cookies, which is a Korean rice cereal with cookies. So it's kind of like a play on cookies and cream with like a malted kind of flavor. And then we have the gojuchang chocolate, which is a Korean chili paste, but it's in a chocolate ice cream base. So it's kind of like a Mexican hot chocolate, but in ice cream form. So it's spicy, but like delicious. It gives me a certain amount of joy to know that, you know, maybe the ice cream store can be around a little longer because you have a younger person who is greatly concerned about the business and wants to improve on it. And that makes me feel very happy. I love that I'm able to work with my dad. My dad's been able to see it become successful because he's gone through so much adversity. Having a family business is like the American dream on a small scale that the average person can identify with. Being a small family business is really special. We've been part of people's like very special occasions, so I want people to remember like, oh, I've gotten my birthday cake from Flushing Ice Cream Factory, or memories, creating memories and traditions. That's really what a family business is about. Christina, uh, do you have any other words to add? Um, I don't like to watch myself on video, <laughs> so I was kind of, it's my first time actually watching this clip as well, and I'm glad that my father had nice things to say about me. <laughs> things that, you know, uh, he never says to me, I often find out in like yeah. interviews, uh, but 
Thank you for the Greater uh, Flushing Chamber of Commerce for producing that video. We're going to inc incorporate that into our website and you made a lot of programs accessible for small businesses like us. And I think that took up enough time. <laughs> so I'll, I'll give it Thank you. And Yang, last but not least. <laughs> Hi. Um, uh, I actually taught here about 20 years ago in the accounting department. And then later I moved to PwC to do technology consulting. And I love technology and I love to um, do new things. So at PwC, in addition to client work, I also helped the firm uh, initiating and uh, developing a lot, a lot of internal initiatives. And uh, I was lucky two years ago to have a chance to come back to Queens College to lead a tech talent pipeline program. And after that, um, become the uh, executive director for the Tech Incubator, which is a place um, that I really like where I can work with a lot of entrepreneurs and uh, working on new ideas and projects, connecting the entrepreneurs uh, with the uh, faculty and the students and uh, with the community. Uh, so uh, I really like the, this, uh, what I'm doing now. Thank you, thank you so much. So, uh, without a doubt, Asian American women are forging new paths as entrepreneurs. They are at the forefront of trendsetting and entrepreneurship. According to Sociable.com, based on a recent study, women own almost 40% of Asian American businesses, a number that's increasing at a faster pace than any other group of women in the United States. In total, Asian American women own almost 750,000 businesses with combined sales over $136 billion, billion with a B. Um, so first we'll jump right in. Um, you know, although there are, these are very impressive statistics that show that Asian American women are um, forging ahead, there are some obstacles that one may not um, expect. Um, for example, I wanted to touch upon like any state or federal policies that may have been hurdles in starting up and running your businesses. Um, uh, Christina and Bianca, any items that come to mind that, you know, for example, any future entrepreneurs that may be out here that, you know, you overcame um, any policy related things or um, we'll also touch upon like capital being an issue, but any thoughts there? Um, I'll talk, speak more about how, because our business, Chinatown Ice Cream Factory has been established longer than Flushing Ice Cream Factory. Okay. So we've seen 9-11, we've seen Hurricane Sandy. Oh, wow. So when we talk about being start up, we've been established already. But when we see disasters like this, I think that uh, from the state and the federal level, they had to give better assistance. I know on, when you see in the media that they're giving all these programs and whatnot, I think they had to make it the, the funding much more accessible instead of making us wait so long and that making it in program forms that were kind of roundabout. Like when I speak about one program that I had participated in, I had to spend money to get supplies for emergency things and then they wouldn't reimburse my money right away. So that's even less funding than not getting funding on top of right. having incurred a natural disaster where I didn't have, I couldn't open by law, I couldn't open, I have no electricity. Right. And even 9-11, a lot of the funding that was given was given to expand your business. That's why most of my neighbors have closed because why, who will want to expand their business when you've incurred a natural disaster where you have to close? So I think that the funding has to be more readily available for small businesses instead of making them fill out like tons of paperwork and then also not reimbursing them and not making accessible. We need to have capital ready at hand to pay our employees, to pay our supplies and to just operate day to day. Thank you, thank you. Um, I just want to add to um, the 9-11 event and as you, as you guys know from my introduction, I'm in the travel industry business, and that was very disruptive to our business. People, you know, both uh, inbound and outbound, it, it affected us a uh, lot. So uh, 
I would also really want the government to maybe establish some funding or have a committee to try to help the community that's, that's in need. And also, uh, besides 9-11, there's also um, uh, Sandy, Sandy. When, uh, when, uh, um, and, also, and also there another occasion, I remember that our whole block was out of electricity and um, we couldn't open and of course on uh, on our block is a lot of restaurants and I well I I, I'm, I don't own a restaurant so I don't have inventory or perishable goods but uh, I would assume that uh, those businesses suffered a lot during uh, during events like this so I uh, would really like the government to make it when something like that happened they need to act fast and that um, business owners know that you know where to get help and where to, to help them that would be very helpful and I on my street for the last year um, I have seen so many turnovers of this of small restaurants is it's, it's one day I would pass by and then I see a new restaurant open and before I get the chance to try it it's closed <laughs> and it's it's very happy breaking that you know when you see a business open you see people has the hope of you know um, of opening business and uh, invest in it and uh, you know have a future but then you see it close so fast and it's just um, uh, I really think that um, maybe uh, the with maybe some assisted funding for, for new businesses that might be helpful and and then there's also regarding regulation. I actually has a kind of a very, uh, very strangely, there's not enough regulation on my industry, I feel like. <laughs> um, because for restaurant, you have to have- Who is like, over-regulated? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you have uh, you know, health inspections and you know, you have to get license and even other, uh, other businesses like a nail salon, you also need licenses. But I feel like for my industry, uh, even um, anyone here, you go in an office and then you could call yourself a travel agency with, mm -hmm. without licensing. And it's actually pretty scary because if I go to a restaurant, I pay, I order the food, I eat it, and the transaction is complete, it's done. But for traveling, you usually buy a ticket. If you go overseas, you buy a ticket two, three months in advance, and you don't travel until two, three months later. And there's instances, um, you know, like a big travel yeah. agency in Chinatown, they uh, they went away with millions of dollars because 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 they just told people that they issued ticket for them or bought certain products for them. And a few months later, when people go to the airport, oh, there's no seat because they never book, they never really booked the seat for them. So um, so I, I think there should be some standardized, standardized regulation how you become, how you could call yourself a travel agency because for my business, I have to, I, well, I, well, we, we choose to register with the Airline Reporting Corporation and the International Air Transport Association. Um, and to join these uh, uh, organizations, we need to have a um, reference letter from major uh, airlines and major wholesalers. And we also need to leave a promissory note in the <coughs> bank to, so in case we make a mistake on the airline ticketing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but, not every, not every company that call themselves tra tra a travel agency has to do that. So and so sometimes customer laws and don't know where to complain because of that. Because if you go to Europe, it's easily for 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 one person, it's easily two three thousand dollar, and the family of four you go is is it like twelve. Um, Twelve thousand dollar, and then you leave it to this one person company, and then three, three, four months later, um, then you go, and then you suddenly you, you, you go, and then there's, you, it was never booked. So, uh, I just feel that there's need to be some more, some more, specifically for the travel industry. Yes. <laughs> so, the policymakers 
you should regulate her industry more than my industry. <laughs> <laughs> That's the moral you want to go, go with. Some of your you should ask for more yeah. regulation. I know. Some of your policymakers should come over to the travel yeah. industry. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, so it did come up, it's a good point about capital that you brought up. I mean, it's just interesting that a lot of the policies are really that you spend the money first and then you get reimbursed months or possibly a year later. Um, on the flip side, I was interested to get some information about, um, or your, get your thoughts about like initial startup costs and funds, um, like any programs that you utilize um, that would be, because I, I find that for Asian women, um, According to some studies that I read, that it's very difficult to get um, to get capital because you know you're female and you're Asian, and um, a lot of the venture capital companies that would provide funding or the banks that mainly um, you know run by men. But if if you haven't if you've had any experiences, or maybe Rosa could provide some input on that. Um, For startups, is usually very challenging because the banks do not want to take the risk on a startup business. Basically, what we need to do in this case is actually go to alternative lenders, and they're, they're the um, nonprofit organizations that will look at the businesses that have been turned down by a bank. Um, so what we do is we work with, a, like, a, if we go to there's a business center for new Americans here in Queens that we can work with. Um, their loans only go up to maybe 250000 We can also work with, there are several uh, organizations. There's True Fund. In Queens, we have business center, uh, business outreach center, OVAC. Um, we have Renaissance, which is uh, under the umbrella of Asian, uh, Asian Americans for Equality. So we have different organizations that we work with. I would say if you're in starting a business, you should also look for the resources that are available. The reason why 80% of businesses fail is because they do not plan, they lack experience, and they don't have the necessary capital. But if you get the necessary, if you get the resource and somebody to guide you through so that you can get the licenses, permits, you can prepare your business plan you have financial projection, you have the experience, and you educate yourself because you need to continue. You, it, you could know your, if, you, if, you're, if you're an IT specialist, you can be good at that, your marketing, but you need to manage, learn to manage your business. The only way you do it is by, by going to the necessary classes and workshops so that you can educate yourself. A business advisor will be able to hold your hands so that you'll be able to guide you through each and every of the steps so that when you open the door to your business, it will be easier. And if you need, um, you need startup, banks will not lend you 100% to start a business. You need to have uh, equity investment in the business. So maybe you could use your friends or family to give you that equity investment to, got, to lend that to you until you're ready to um, pay them back in a few years and then we can approach the bank. But if we have the paperwork, we go to the right uh, lending institution, you may not qualify, but you need to have good credit. We have to make sure you have the credit score. If you don't have a good credit score, maybe we need to get you ready and find out what's going on with your credit to fix it. So we go with a package. It's easier for a lender, even if you're a startup, to go to a lender that is willing to do startups instead of just going to any bank. Thank you. That's very informational, infor informative. <laughs> um, Ying, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, sure. I, I think one of the things uh, for the entrepreneurs is that uh, they don't necessarily know where the resources are. Um, there are different organizations supporting different sectors and. Uh, with different criteria, so if we know, if we can make those information available to them, then there's more, uh, more venue that you can go to to get funding. There are organizations specifically help, try, trying to help Asian women entrepreneurs, and there are organizations trying to help uh, businesses of certain scale. So, so that's one point, and to know where, um, where you can get help in addition to the, uh, the the ones that we normally go to. Um, and then the other thing is that in 
I think to, it's, it would be helpful if you you are part of the ecosystem or network and take in incubator for example. It's a, it's a very small um, uh, kind of a network. Uh, within the incubator, we have companies like 61st now is a member of our comp uh, of our member company. So any companies that need uh, help with a video filming, they can go to them to. Uh, to ask for their services, and we have CPAs in residence, and a lot of the member companies use our resident CPA to do that, and we have uh, IT and cybersecurity firm. And so, so within your immediate um, network, and also expanded further uh, to, to the Queens and uh, New York City network, you will have you will find a lot more resources you can tap into, and and. Recently, I just attend the event also through uh, creative, innovative ways. Um, I saw uh, one woman was saying uh, she's kind of using the uh, idea of uh, giving a baby shower, so and um, having doing a registry for what she needs to open up a business. So she basically invited her family and friend and creating a registry to help her get her initial funding. So they're just. There are different ways, creative ways you might be able to do to get things you need. Not, not all of them necessarily involves money. Sometimes you can also uh, exchange things with using, a, if you have space, if you have, a, like the Queens College has a lot of students who can help with uh, web development or mo mobile development and they all need experience so you can kind of exchange uh, that. And uh, one other thing is that uh, there are grants that a faculty has that are research oriented, but it's also helping small businesses with innovative ideas. So if you team up with the faculty, that may be another way to get funding. Thank you, thank you. So um, next, um, I wanted to touch upon some examples of any failures that any of you have um, encountered. Um, as the saying goes, failure is the mother of success. Um, so any you know, you know, previous experiences that you've had and how you overcame those failures um, and maybe some important qualities that um, an entrepreneur, a Asian American entrepreneur would need um, to overcome those failures. Anyone who wants to jump at it for? <laughs> I try not to look at anything as a failure. That's my perspective. I just think of it like uh, just a stepping stone. That's good. My father always said this to me. There's, there's, there's always those perfectionists that they have to get something so right before they do it. And that's also a fault too because when you get it so right, you can't improve on it because and when you put it out, it's never really perfect. And then you don't really see how you can't really grow from it. So I just look at it as... You just try what you're going to try, and then you just build on that. So it's never really a failure. You're just evolving. It's a good um, point. I'm part of a lot of Asian women business groups as well. I was the youngest board member of Asian women in business. I'm newer to the flushing community in terms of the business realm, but um, I have deep roots here as well. I've, ta I've spoken on a lot of panels. I've also heard a lot of panels as well. Um, but the thing that I've heard that echoes from most of the panels is don't look at setbacks for being an Asian woman, just play it to your advantage. Mm -hmm. So I try not to let that hold me back. I'm very cognitive that I'm an Asian woman because you just can't hide it. It's kind of like being a woman in a mechanic shop. Sometimes mm -hmm. it just doesn't work for you. Right. But the thing is that you could also play it to your advantage as well. Like there's certain thing, ways you could speak to people or certain programs that you might be eligible for that you could build on. And even my brand, Chinatown Ice Cream Factory and then Flushing Ice Cream Factory, my brand is basically built on that I'm an Asian entrepreneur. Right. So there was something that was very marketable there. In the late 70s, haagen claims that they were the first to create cookies and cream. Can you believe that? Mm -hmm. So you could imagine how novel that lychee, green tea, mango, I'm kind of dating myself here because I see some like very young people in the audience. <laughs> so before, when I was a kid, when I sold green tea ice cream, I have to give them samples and they would ask me, what is green tea? That's so weird. And I, was, and I, I don't even know how to explain green tea. 
sweet tea. <laughs> I know I should have had a better example, but this is before the evolution of like food TV and whatnot. But now that Snapple in Arizona, they have it so mainstream, Lipton it has green tea. It's almost a staple in any type of uh, tea shop. Right. So I think uh, you have to play it to your advantage. You can't just think about being Asian or a woman as a disadvantage. You just have to know how to build on it. Right, 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 right. Thank you, thank you. So um, I was interested to uh, hear um, you all share like how you manage the other aspects of your business. So of course the entrepreneur comes with the great ideas and implements those ideas to uh, service their customers, but um, like how do you manage you know the finance and accounting piece of it or any legal um, you know support that you might need or you know even down to like HR you know s dealing with staff and um, pay you know salaries things like that um, do you generally like manage it all or do you kind of outsource those things like how do you get by um, you know to ensure that all aspects of your business are running smoothly <laughs> well yes I do manage it all oh. <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> so um, uh, it's also adding to the previous um, question about failure. Um, I oh, don't yes. see it as failure, but more like restructuring. Um, just because, well, the company I used to run it with my mother, and we tried to do everything on our own. Um, at one point, we besides a travel agency, we also have we also have three bus companies, and we have almost 70 employees and I and I managed the payroll for all of them okay. so when it's payday it's very hectic for me um, so uh, but um, it becomes very overwhelming and uh, so um, and also you know being a woman I know very limited about mechanics um, so we rely on you know it's a family business so we rely on family members who are mechanics to kind of take the lead on managing the bus companies, but they, different people also have different goals for themselves and then they started wanting to start their own business, um, then it becomes that we have to rely on uh, outsiders, even though they're very loyal, to manage our companies. And then I did an audit on our bus company's inventory and we have 300 something thousand dollar sits in the storage room and, and it's just bus parts and I so I told my mom that we cannot continue to be like this and bear the burdens and then not knowing not knowing exactly how to manage the bus company without the help so we finally we, we before we were owners 100% owners of the bus companies and we actually give uh, of the ownership to the bus, bus managers and so they will share the responsibility of sharing the profit and also loss of the company so it makes them um, more conscious of how much they spend <laughs> on buying parts. This is not for, for us when Bloomingdale's a sale we go crazy but it, it seems like for them when ABC, when ABC bus has a sale they went out there and shop for parts. <laughs> But it's not necessary. So, um, so and so this kind of restructuring really helps. So we now only focus on the travel agency, and so I have um, less uh, less accounting work to do because now I don't do payroll for the bus company, <laughs> and they and they manage it all. So uh, it really helps to um, it really helps to actually help us. Uh, focus and let us focus on what we do best. Right, right, exactly, exactly. That's great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else would like to add? Okay, um, so just in general, um, I was curious to hear like who your mentors are um, and who you, you look to for advice, because I, I feel I'm sure, I mean, for myself personally, I think mentors are a very important aspect of my life. Um, for my career, so I don't, you know, I was looking. I was wondering what you look for in a mentor. If you have a mentor, you know, who do you look to for advice? I feel like I have a lot of peers, or doesn't peers meaning that we do similar industry, that we're in business, and we kind of have a creative mindset. 
but I try not to look to one person particularly, right. even though I was assigned a formal mentor. I think it's kind of limiting. I think it's good to have like a raw, broad uh, network of people that you can go for for different things. Agreed, yeah. Um, and I think it's easier to make someone a friend first and then get to know them and then not really think of them so formally. Right, right. I think it, it's kind of, my industry is sort of creative, so okay. <clears throat> I think uh, you have different ideas and different friends for different days. Right, right, right. <laughs> definitely, definitely. I agree. I agree. Um, any thoughts on, you know, this was um, an aspect of maybe things that are just difficult to juggle, but, um, you know, juggling family responsibilities, whether it be children or, um, you know, parent, elderly parents, just overall, you know, anything, any advice? Um, because I'm sure owning your own business, it becomes very stressful, juggling everything together. <laughs> So well, um, I um, I am actually thankful that um, my husband has been <laughs> has been able to pick up a lot of the parenting responsibility because he he's in finance and oh, he's great. partner in his own firm, so his oh. schedule is very flexible. And he used to have to commute to the city a lot, but uh, but now he mostly works at home. So oh, all great. the doctors' appointments, <laughs> <laughs> all the after school activities, yeah. all the you know play days, he's 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 doing he's doing everything. That's and uh, and I feel bad that I probably spend more time in board meeting than parenting. <laughs> but um, so I try to on the weekends. Yes. I'm sorry if you try to send me or con uh, send me email or contact me on the weekends because I don't check my emails <laughs> on the weekends. I just focus on my family to make up for the time. Yes, agreed, agreed. I, f I feel like no matter what industry or career or entrepreneurship you're in, that's always a, a, a struggle. <laughs> but it's good to cut disconnect on Fridays. I agree with Bianca. Sometimes having a supportive spouse is good. Um, my husband does construction, so he st he went to CrossFit at four thirty this morning, <laughs> and then he would then he will start his day at before seven. So, but he gets able to pick up. The, he's always able to do pick up by before six. So oh. our kids go to school much later. Our kids go. To, they all I know is going to school till six. <laughs> yes. <laughs> my what my older daughter now that she goes to public school, she said to me, she's like, mom. You know, not everybody goes to school seven days a week. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? Everyone goes to school seven days a week. You're Asian. She's catching on. She's catching on. <laughs> um, but having a supportive spouse is really important. And uh, I think also, does any, did anyone watch Working Moms, like on Netflix? Yeah. So I think also you get to a point where sometimes you have to say no to things and it hurts you. But that's okay. Yeah. I think that it's, life is a balance. You can't have it all. Right. There's been some really good opportunities that I can't specifically speak of where it would require me to uproot my family or expand our business. But then I looked at my kids and I was, you know, I enjoy seeing them. Right. Right. And I don't want to. How much bigger could you? You would have to give up so much more, like micromanaging on a small scale. And I want to see my kids, so I just prefer to see them yeah. when I can. Agreed, agreed. Um, so next we'll um, go into, um, again, uh, you know, I think we touched upon these already, like regarding the resources um, when we talked about the capital. Um, but I wanted to mention there were like a few other groups, um, which um, Rosa can start us off and talk about the SBDC and what their mission is um, overall. Um, the mission of New York SBDC is to provide um, customized solutions in the form of advisement, education, research, and advocacy for the startups, innovators, and the small and medium enterprise community. Uh, we assist with business plan development, financial projections. We actually do the financial projections for the client. Uh, we encourage our clients to prepare their business plans and we'll edit it, make sure that it looks presentable in the package. But when it comes to the financial projection, we actually sit down and prepare it for them. Uh, we also we provide ed marketing. We identify sources of capital, uh, market research, 
we have a research network in Albany, and if, there, if our clients need market research for the business plan, we actually ask Albany to give us the information, and uh, they'll send us basically a, uh, a package, and um, the client can use it to prepare his business, his or her business plan. Um, we assist with up educating them on operation, international trade, and uh, tech, tech startups. And we also have what is called, and we work with MWBEs to get the businesses certified. Uh, we assist with the application, and we also have a program called BitLinks. So if you're a small business, and you're, even if you're not certified, we can get you on the uh, you're on the database, and then you will find out if there are any opportunities for you to do business with, with the government. Okay? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I uh, guess that's one, one of the items I was going to mention to the MWBE that, um, and for those of you who may not know, it's the minority and women owned business enterprise, and it encourages minorities. Uh, and women business owners to uh, certify with the state and take advantage of current and upcoming state procurement uh, opportunities. Uh, Wishwas is also another organization um, that's based, a nonprofit organization based in Queens, and they actually are here today in case anyone has any questions um, and like would, would like to touch base with them. Um, any other organizations that you guys can think of that may not have been mentioned yet? Uh, I could think of Greater Flushing Chamber of Commerce. Oh yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes. but and yes. also Flushing, and also Flushing uh, Business Improvement District. Um, besides um, being a uh, on the board of director, I'm also program committee chair for both organizations. So I think I could speak a little bit about their programs that help uh, this, uh, small businesses. Um, recently, Greater Fortune Chamber of Commerce has the Google uh, live stream uh, to help um, small businesses with marketing, and then also uh, we have the, um, I don't remember how to say the name, but it's training on the WeChat, how to marketing on, uh, how to marketing on uh, WeChat, and actually, um, is it Canvic? Yeah, can we um, training? <laughs> um, they also they are going to have a workshop later at the Flushing Business uh, Flushing Welfare, um, three to four. I signed up, <laughs> so <laughs> so um, that's really that really uh, helps uh, small businesses because as you know, um, small businesses we have to do you know legal accounting and also marketing ourselves. So uh, these types of programs I think really help the small businesses. Oh, Rosa. Um, I also would like to add other city resources. They have Small Business Administration. If you go to sba.gov, we are actually we're funded by the Small Business Administration, also the State of New York and City University of New York. Um, and SBA, they have a website, sba.gov, and there is a resource guide that is available online, and you'll find all the resources in the City of New York. You have SCORE that's present here they can provide you with assistance. We have Queens Economic Development, Co uh, Development Corporation, Queens Economic, and then within that organization, you have the Women Business Center and the Entrepreneurial Assistance Center. You have New York City Business Solutions, and uh, Business Center for New Americans also provides uh, assistance. And um, Renaissance, they also provide technical assistance. Uh, Bach Network and New York City Business Development Corporation, even though they're an alternative lender, they can also, they also provide uh, technical assistance. And of course, we, the, the Queen's Chamber of Commerce. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Yang? Yeah, there are a lot of meetups in the city that uh, can help both the women and entrepreneurs and, uh, and also um, the, all the uh, all the incubators and accelerators that there are mm -hmm. also a lot of them in the city that they they have uh, regular events and workshops and and they can also give a lot of information regarding funding regarding how do you run the business and all of that so I encourage you to attend some of them sure. yeah mm -hmm. thank you oh, and, sure. and the work we provide monthly workshops and they all they basically each have a different uh, theme. 
We also have a, an inventors club for those people who are inventors and who would like to learn more about patenting, uh, prototyping, and uh, those sort of things. We have, it's, and it's all free. It's free to the small business owner. Even if you're just thinking about it, the services we provide, even if you want to basically do some research and find out about whether or not, if you're, if you're interested in, with your business, when you start a different business, we're there for you. And uh, we provide you the, the, that monthly uh, education so that you can, from any, anywhere from starting a business to doing business with government. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so really quickly, I, will, I, I thought, um, Bianca, you'd have some great input into like a, a global phenomenon um, regarding like Asian female entrepreneurs. Um, and when I was reading up some materials, um, it seemed that um, uh, women in China were really getting a lot of opportunities to become entrepreneurs. Um, I was thinking maybe through your travels, um, did you have any you know input or um, what you've seen and maybe how it may be different from you know the United States or New York, um, like if, if female um, entrepreneurs are encouraged or their policies are different. Um, well, my uh, my industry predominantly uh, I'm mostly female, um, except for certain positions like tour guides or bus drivers, then mostly male. But I think my industry are mostly female because um, because we need to listen, has the patience to listen and also understand what the customer need. Um, so the so all the other um, companies that I deal with in Asia, um, they are mostly in charge of that mostly women are in charge so that's a good thing um i am not sure if they have the luxury of getting so much help from the government like we have in the united states um i hope they do but um like i said all the other countries that i deal with mostly i have I, I deal with women except for japan i think japan is still a little um we serve in that sense, <laughs> um, um, but um, I think I think globally, women are stepping forward, yeah. and we are not backing down, and so we, uh, you know, it helps to for women to help each other. I think yeah. because you know, it's not you are not bringing you are not bringing another competitor. You are bringing a friend, and we. Um, together we could um, help contribute to the global economy. Yes, definitely, definitely. Thank you. Um, so I would like to ensure we have enough time for a question and answer um, for the audience. Uh, so I just wanted to wrap up and get your thoughts on, like, um, for Rosa, like the, you know, future of the Asian American female entrepreneurs um, or any programs and then um, from everyone else maybe the future of your businesses and um, you know just to give some insight as to what may be coming in the future well I um, I think if the future of the Asian woman entrepreneurs is going to continue to grow uh, because they have the the strong the strong women who are now entrepreneurs to guide them, to show them, to mentor them. And uh, most of the Asian women who are entrepreneurs, they're, they're there to, to, to work with other, to basically guide them and show them to take it to the next step. So I, I, I see a lot of mentors because the women here they're involved in so many organizations, and yeah. those organizations are out there to help other. Right. And and they basically are going to make their, their children going to be looking up to them. Yes. And they're since they've been they're growing up in an entrepreneurial environment. I see them becoming entrepreneurs in the future. Mm. Yes, that's true. That's very true. Bianca, Christina. 
Any like closing thoughts or? Oh, Ying. Yeah, there's a, there's a huge demand from the industry to um, to make their workforce more diverse and uh, include more women. And so, uh, from tech incubator perspective, we also wanted to support and help women entrepreneurs to get into um, business, especially in in high tech areas like like AI space. Um, companies find now many business benefits. Uh, to include women so that the, the algorithms being developed are not so biased. So there is a business benefit and there is really a need for it. And uh, we, we would like to help as much as we can to encourage more women to get into technology, to get more uh, girls into STEM, into computer science. And one of the things we're doing is trying to, uh, we're actually started uh, the Girls Who Code Club uh, on weekends for the last semester and we want to continue that so we want to help um, get get them in earlier on so so that they they are interested and they get into uh, these uh, more uh, tech heavy uh, industries to to reduce the bias <laughs> um, yeah thank you thank you um, I'd like to close out by also saying something about Queen's College I actually very connected with Queens College. I went to Kaplan in the basement of the Student Union, even though I didn't get to get into a specialized school. Um, but I also did my summer school sessions at Queens College while attending the University of Rochester. And I actually did my master's at Queens College in education. So I really love Queens College. Um, and it allowed me to work and do my master's at the same time. So I think that their program was very flexible. And I think that they make it very accessible to people who work um, to finish up higher education. Um, for myself and my business, I would kind of like to go back to teaching in higher education. I previously taught at uh, Introductions to Entrepreneurship at the Metropolitan College of New York mm -hmm. and served on their advisory board as well. Um, it's not something that my time affords right now, but I would like to get to a place in my businesses because we've expanded to three businesses after 40 years of no, no expansion. So as my kids grow a little older, I'd like to return back to like my roots in education mm -hmm. um, and just make sure the quality of my businesses maintain instead of expanding rapidly, which a lot of businesses do, making sure the quality of all of my stores art as well as I can manage it. So um, for my business, I think I have a lot to talk with Rosa about <laughs> later <laughs> because um, uh, like uh, we mentioned, and the and the um, and uh, also uh, actually uh, SBS, they also, and Great Flushing of Chamber, uh, Flushing Chamber of Commerce, and um, I think the Flushing Business Improvement District also, we host a lot of seminars about um, how to get, how to certify for minority women um, owned business. Uh, I went to a few, and I think I got down how to, how to get myself certified, but as I look forward, I try to, I try to uh, scope out, so what kind of opportunity opportunities would I have and I have um, I have uh, no clue <laughs> I don't know where to look <laughs> so I, I actually recommend to um, Jose at, at SBS I, I, I know I see a lot of programs and seminars that are being held how to get certified but could you also invest some resources in letting, um, letting what, what what's the next what's the next step would be? You know, where, you know, after you start by, you need to get business. Right, right. 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 So what well, we have a procurement technical assistance center. They can match your business to see where, what government organization might be able to use mm -hmm. your services. So that's, once you become certified, you can work with them. Mm -hmm. Once you, so that's the next step. Okay. That's great. Because um, I, recently I have uh, this discussion with, our bus managers, we do a lot of subchartering for big bus company okay. like uh, like uh, Academy. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> our buses were subchartered to uh, Bethpage for the U.S. Open, mm -hmm. like all 23 of our buses. 
but we didn't get a contract ourselves, but we were supporter and also um, a lot of uh, schools, university organization. When they need shuttle buses, they always think of, oh, let's call academy. <laughs> let's so, call. So once so, you become certified, you can also see if you could so, maybe work with yeah. city university or the state university and get contracts. Mm. So that's why we need to talk. Yes, about. Bianca and Rosa will be talking later. <laughs> well, thank you all very much. Um, very, it's been very informative and very helpful, I'm sure, to everyone. And thank you for taking your time again. Um, thank you. Hi, I'm, I'm very interested in the idea of small businesses in a world of giants. So you're successful at what you're doing. How do you go up against all of the online travel agencies? How do you go up against the, um, the chains, the Baskin Robbins? What do you do to make yourself special enough to, to be small but important? I'll give Bianca a plug. I, I purchased my tickets from Bianca and I've also referred her to my family members. There's also a need for I, I'm actually like a dinosaur, even though like I know how to use Facebook on my phone. I don't like to surf on Expedia, and sometimes there's a need to have a real travel agent tell you, I need to stop and do this, I need to do this. There's like a one-to-one -one interaction, and I think when you build a level of trust with someone, that also helps. That, that's something that the internet can't take away from you. Um, I also have ice cream. <laughs> yes. We're neighbors on this walk. And not the row for lunch. So um, yes, uh, with um, when when my mom started the business, it was back in the eighties. Um, so uh, internet is not that what wasn't that popular, and so we didn't have uh, that much competition. So business was thriving. And but as you know, Expedia and also Hotel.com, Booking.com. And we are competing with everyone's phone because everyone has the app on their phone, right? <laughs> so even I myself has Expedia app <laughs> on my phone. So, um, but um, it's sometimes it's simple um, for myself. I like everyone else when I book my own travel. I also see, I also see on check on Expedia first to see the pricing. Then I'll try to try to use my own resources to see if I could get a better pricing. But of course, I. Of course, I mostly, most of the time, I, I do. Um, so, um, and I understand that retail business is getting harder and harder to do. So now we focus on doing more uh, group tours because uh, for uh, organization, like um, we took a uh, youth orchestra, which is an organization of a uh, uh, group of um, teenage uh, young musicians, they go perform in Japan and Taiwan, and we would help them to, you know, reserve hotel and plan the itinerary when they need to, um, when they need to, uh, when they need to perform, and you know, transporting their equipment. And the youth orchestra usually is fifty to sixty people, so. If you are doing it on your own, like parents coordinating, then then you have to for like a whole ten days. You have to breakfast, lunch, dinner. You have to make reservations on for like what for different restaurants for sixty people. It's really really hard for you know parents to do it on their own. So this is where we provide our service. And um, our biggest group was uh, a group of uh, medical professional, Kaipa. Um, they um, they went uh, they went to Taiwan to um, visit the hospital to do information exchange, and that was 150 people, and we have five buses, and and as you know, it's not easy to find a restaurant that could accommodate 150 people coming all at once to mm -hmm. to have lunch and dinner, and so that's um, so that now we are focusing more and doing more of this type of group tour, and that's I think. Uh, this is what the online um, the online retailers um, have not been able to do yet. Yeah. So you yeah. 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 <laughs> Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Vinny. I own a digital media, that is digital marketing and advertising company. 
Uh, I have a question specifically about SBA. I have seen resistance and skepticism towards non-tangible businesses, um, you know, from the state as well as from private mentors. Uh, is there anything that you can recommend that may, I may have missed out? Because I don't see any programs supporting, you know, technology or new age businesses or ideas. Thank you. Well, I would say that technology is, cybersecurity is one of the things that's very, it's like in the, everything that you talk about is cybersecurity. So the, there are programs within, I would say the state, there's actually trying to work, make sure that you, you, you have all this information on cybersecurity, that you get educated on cybersecurity. Um, but I would say it's better to speak one-on-one -on -one and, and see what is available out there because we can do research and we can find out. Mm -hmm. Oh, somebody. Okay. Sorry, just to add to that. Uh, when I, so I'm not into cybersecurity. I know there's amazing you know, programs for cybersecurity IT, but when it comes to you know, technology that can actually uh, bring attention to these products or these companies is where I'm finding resistance. Yeah, uh, like I am a minority owned business owner, sorry, minority business owner that is dealing in a non-tangible asset. So I need support in mentorship as to how, what is the best way to bring my product or my idea out there. That's why you have to speak, basically work one-on-one -on -one with a business advisor. And we have a business advisor here whose specialty, uh, she might be able, she will be able to work with you, okay? Amber Chen will be able to work with you. <laughs> we have two business advisors here that can work with you. Any other questions? Oh, in the front. Hi, I just want to make a comment, um, in, including uh, Bianca, uh, on her business for travel. Uh, you can't beat uh, her experience. If, if you need any help uh, in, in or not only organizing, uh, let's say you have a family reunion or whatever with different tastes and different interests, she can give you the experience to uh, include everyone and to tell you where to go and not places not to go and uh, you know how to protect yourself and and that helps you know it's not just uh, oh you want to go to some place quick and you know that that's it and that that is for any experienced person uh, whether you're beginning the business or whatever you can't beat the experience they have the experience they're expert at whatever they do and that's why you go to them, okay? So that's just my point of view, okay? <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I have a question for all of the panelists, uh, Ying and Rosa and Christine and Bianca. Current political climate, I was just wondering if that has any effect on your programs or your Well, I would say that it does affect the program because uh, when it comes to the state, they reduce our, our, our uh, funding. And when it comes to the federal, we're fighting to make sure that we have the funding to be able to assist our, our clients. So that's basically up in Albany, but uh, it does come down to, to the centers. However, however, they have done everything possible, New York State's SBDC, to make sure that our um, business advisors are not affected. They actually have taken a lot of the cut upstate uh, in the central office so that our centers, uh, we can provide the services to, to the community. Thank I, I think it's really, um, 
It's definitely much harder for uh, international students to come to the college to study, and also, I, I think, uh, also becomes more difficult for international companies to come and work here. Uh, we actually worked with uh, New, New York City own EDC to bring companies from abroad to work at the incubator, and uh, it was successful in the first year, and uh, we, we have done interviews in the recent, recent years, and uh, there are quite a few companies that we would like to bring in, and uh, the process is almost like impossible to go through. So it's definitely impacting the... Uh, Thank I you. Have, I have a more Question. simple business, so mm -hmm. I, everything that we do is very local based, and my father has this policy in general that we try to stay out of politics, and <laughs> politics stays out of us. But uh, no, it's a very, it's, it's a crazy world out there, but uh, even in like recessions, our price point is pretty affordable, so it's considered a luxury even when there's bad things that happen, so ice cream tends to be a very stable like business, luckily, knock on wood. It's, it won't like skyrocket, but it's also just an everyday type of like happiness. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Go ahead, John. So, thank you so much for such an enlightening discussion today. I just had a quick question following up on what Bianca was saying regarding um, getting more contracts for minority and women-owned businesses, you know, we try and help cert certify uh, women-owned businesses, but then what happens afterwards and how do we get them more businesses? I know as a Chamber of Commerce for Flushing, we have a commitment to spending most of our very limited budgets and resources on local businesses, and we contract out a lot of our work to um, small businesses in Flushing. How do we get larger organizations, the C Queen's College, um, invested in uh, the state of New York to investing in small businesses. Uh, how do we get, I guess, sponsorship? Yeah. Sponsorship would be the best way to get the private sector involved in the public sector right. because we do need the assistance to be able to continue providing the services in that all the public organizations that are in this room. And so, for the women's certification, we need to educate them on how to get the loans. Mm -hmm. Right, but what happens is most of the ones that become certified and then they go and they bid on, the, on a contract, then they don't know how to go and do the RFP. So they, this is where they get stuck. So this is what we need to continue educating them. They, they do have a, I think they have a work, they have classes on that. <laughs> One more. No. Okay. Good morning. Hi, I'm Brendan Levy with Queen's Chamber of Commerce. Um, just an FYI, um, we're at the center of unprecedented development and opportunity in Queens on, the, on a national scale. There's going to be over $30 billion, that's with a B, between <laughs> LaGuardia Airport, uh, the main terminal, Delta Airlines, brand new $4 billion terminal. They're going to widen the Van Wick. Uh, we're talking about close to $14 billion at JFK. And there's a set aside for 30% for MWBE. Mm -hmm. You can be sure the Queen's Chamber, um, our president, is on all the steering committees, JFK redevelopment. There's going to be development at Willits Point. Learn about what's going on in Queens. You're welcome to come to our events. Mm -hmm. We've been holding ongoing MWBE educational seminars. They're complimentary. So we're, we're very good at connecting the dots. Please come see me if, the, if you're looking to learn more about MWBE opportunities. We have uh, a woman minority transportation company that secured contracts with Delta Airlines. We're glad to connect the dots.
and point you in the right direction of where those opportunities are. Where we sit is very advantageous. Take advantage of that. Thank you. Thank you, Brendan. Okay, great. Well, first I want to thank our panelists and Jennifer for a very informative discussion. I do have some parting gifts. Uh, as a reminder, today's forum was recorded for later broadcast on QPTV. Please check your lo local listings for time. Again, we wish, if you wish to make a donation, you can do so by giving a check out at the front desk or you can see me. Our business forums will resume in the fall and I want you to note that the next business forum is actually gonna be on a Wednesday. So we're switching gears a little bit. Uh, Wednesday, September 25th, and our first forum will feature Chancellor Felix Matos Rodriguez and the Cornell University President Martha Pollack and our interim president, William Tramitano, who will moderate what will no doubt be a great discussion about high tech and higher ed in New York City and beyond. And we will be sending out notices. Other forums are planned on eSports, financial literacy, and our Gen Z students. And then we're also going to try and do a special business of media coverage of the 2020 presidential election. It promises to be a very exciting forum season next year. Again, I thank you for coming. I would like to just take this time to thank Investors Bank again for their generous donation to our students and wish you all a long and relaxing summer vacation.